Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Dick Powell, Claire Trevor, June Dupre, and Mike Mazurki in Murder, My Sweet. Ladies and gentlemen, your guest producer, Mr. Irving Pitchell. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. In answer to the proverb that a leopard cannot change its spots, we bring you tonight a gentleman who turns his back on many years of light and frothy roll by which he climbed to stardom and takes the part of a ruthless, hard-as-nails detective in a drama as relentless as the crimes that it unfolds. He's Dick Powell, hailed so enthusiastically as Philip Marlowe in RKO's sensational success, Murder, My Sweet. Co-starred with him in her screen role as the fatal and mysterious Helen is Claire Trevor. Also, June Dupre, whose natural loveliness would lead us to expect a touch of romance in our play. And towering above our microphones is Mike Mazurki, as the quietly alarming Moose Malloy. Four characters of widely different natures and conflicting motives, involved in one of the screen's most baffling and complex mysteries, a story that in its published form was one of the best-selling thrillers of our time. Most of the action of Murder, My Sweet takes place right here in Hollywood, not too far from our stage. If you saw the picture, you've seen many Hollywood sights from Malibu Beach to Sunset Towers, from the skyline of Los Angeles to the canyons of our hills, landmarks as native to Hollywood as the radio and motion picture studios from which these dramas come. In fact, the name Lux on the outside of our theater is, I venture to say, as familiar a landmark in this capital of entertainment as Lux Soap itself is familiar in the dressing rooms of screen scar stars. A standard of complexion care from coast to coast, Lux Toilet Soap is a friendly link between your home and Hollywood. And now, we take you to the downtown section of our city and the first act of Murder, My Sweet, starring Dick Powell as Philip Marlowe, Claire Trevor as Helen, June Dupre as Anne, and Mike Mazurki as Moose Malloy. When you got something to say, start at the beginning. Okay. It's 7 o'clock at night, and I'm in a 2 by 4 coupe I call my office. I sit at my desk and look at the sign on the door. Philip Marlowe, it says. Philip Marlowe, private investigator. Hmm. That's a nice title for somebody you go to see when you don't want to see the law. I was tired out. I'd been out peeking under old Sunday sections for a barber named Dominic, whose wife wanted him back. I forget why. Anyway, I didn't find him, and the only reason I took the job was because my bank account was trying to crawl under a duck. I just found out all over again how big Los Angeles is. My brain felt like a plumber's handkerchief. I took out my little black book and decided to go grouse hunting. Nothing like soft shoulders to improve my morale. I'm dialing a number when the door opens and he walks in. The mountain that walks like a man. The biggest mug I ever saw outside of a side show. You, Milo? Yeah? I've seen your name downstairs. They had the names that was in the building. You're a private eye, huh? That's right. i like you to look for somebody. I'm closed up, pal. I looked for her where she worked, but I've been out of touch. Come around tomorrow, we'll talk about it. I think maybe we should do it now. Let go of me, you big ape. I don't mean to do nothing. Here, I give you some dough. You come with me. Okay. Okay, I come with you. It ain't far. A cafe on Central Avenue. We can pick up a cab. The place was called Florian's. It looked like trouble, but that didn't bother me. The two twenties the big lug had dropped felt nice and snug against my appendix. I tried to figure out who he was looking for. I tried to picture him in love with somebody, but it didn't work. They changed this place a lot. There used to be a stage in some boots. Lattice work in pink flowers. She was cute like a bug's ear. A redhead. Eight years since I've seen her. Six years she didn't write. But she'll have a reason. Yeah, yeah, she'll have a reason. What did you do here, singer? Yeah. Let's you and me nibble a couple. Hey, Jack. Yeah? Whiskey. Hey, boss, he's here again. He said you're here again. Yeah. I come in before. I try to find her. Now, look, big boy, I told you once I'm sorry about your girl, but she ain't here. Her name is Velma. You never heard of Velma, Mr. Florian? 
She used to work here. You better drink up, Joe. That lady at the end of the bar. Maybe she knows. I have to request you don't bother the customers, see? Lady, you remember a girl used to work here? Her name was Velma. You talking to me? I said leave the customers alone. So far you rate me polite, huh? I don't bother you none. Swallow your drink and get out of here. Get out of my way. <laughs> Come on, pal. Eight years is a lot of gin. They don't know anything about Velma here. Some guys has the wrong idea when it gets fancy. And the boss was no lightweight, but Moose picked him up like a rag doll and dropped him in the corner pocket. Moose seemed a little dazed as he walked out, and I tagged after him down the street. That guy in there, he shouldn't have talked to me like that. Sure, sure, pal. What's the next stop? Who asked you to stick your face in? Remember me? I'm the detective you hired, Chunky. Oh, the name is Moose. Cut him, I'm large. Moose Malloy. That place ain't like it used to be. There used to be a stage and some boots. You said that. Maybe I told you too much. Maybe I... Let go of my arm. Huh? We was to be married, me and Velma. Where you figure I'd been them eight years I said about? Catching butterflies. San Quentin I'd been. Look, you find Velma for me, huh? Has she got a last name? Velma Valento. Now you beat it. Sure, sure. How do I get in touch with you? I get in touch with you. Tomorrow, maybe. So tomorrow comes and I'm thinking about Moose Malloy and that bucket of mud look on the face of the boss and Florian's when I hear footsteps coming my way down the hall. Moose was coming back, except it wasn't Moose. It was another new customer. Good-looking guy, well-dressed, like a movie star. Mr. Marlowe, my name is Marion. Come in, come in. Who put in the pitch for me, Mr. Marion? Pitch? <laughs> oh, no one, no one. I... I saw your name in the classified section of the phone book. I'm in a clutch at the moment, Mr. Marriott. Your what? I'm busy. I couldn't take on anything big. What have you got in mind? I'd like your services tonight, if for just a few hours. I'm meeting some men. I, I'm paying them some money. How much money and what for? I can't go into that. I've simply agreed to serve as the bearer of the money. Oh, you just want me to go along and hold your hand. I'm afraid I don't like your manner. Yeah, I've had complaints before, but it keeps getting worse. How much are you offering me for doing nothing? I hadn't got around to thinking about it. You suppose you could get around to thinking about it now? How would you like a swift punch on the nose? Oh, dear, I tremble at the thought of such violence. I, uh, I'll give you a hundred dollars. If that isn't enough, say it's so. It's enough, it's enough. This is all I can tell you. Some jewels were taken from a friend of mine in a holdup. I'm buying them back tonight. Where? I'm to drive my car to a rather secluded canyon near Malibu. Uh-huh. We drive out there to buy back some jewelry for a lady friend. I didn't say that. Chances are that these men, whoever they are, don't intend roughing you up if you play a ball. But they wouldn't like you being twins. Now, one of us might get hurt. No, Mr. Marriott, I'm afraid I can't do anything for you. I see. But I'll take your hundred bucks and tag along for the ride. One more thing. Yes? I carry the shopping money and I do the driving. Very well. We drove down that night. Somehow I knew we were being watched. I didn't see anything. The fog was a nice dish of puree St. Germain. I felt it coming. I was a toad on a wet rock and a snake was looking down my neck. Slow down. We're getting near the spot. Shh, quiet. There should be some white posts along the road. Pull in your head. In back of the white post, there's the path. The path goes down into a hollow. That's where we're to wait. Hey, hey, look. Huh? White post. All right, stop the car. Now, you sit tight, and I'll go down and have a look-see. Have you got a flashlight? Yeah. Don't be more than a couple of minutes. There's nobody here, Marriott. This whole setup looks like a tryout, seeing if you obey orders. Let's pull around the corner and... I caught the blackjack right behind my ear and a black pool opened up at my feet. I dived in. It had no bottom. I uh, felt pretty good, just like an amputated leg. I don't know how much time went by. I forgot to look at my watch. But as I came to, I started to call for Marriott. Marriott. Marriott! Are you all right? What happened? Well, who, who are you? Oh. Hey, come back here. Come back here. Hello? Hello? Police headquarters. 
Let me talk to Randall, Inspector Randall. One moment, please. Inspector Randall? Randall, this is Marlowe. Marlowe? Oh, yeah? Yeah, look. I'm at a gas station down near Malibu, the foot of Woodbridge. So? You better get on here. A guy named Marriott's just been knocked off, beaten to death with a blackjack. <laughs> Randall, I told you a dozen times what happened. I'd like you to tell me again, here in my big, comfortable office. Who killed Marriott? An amateur killed him, or somebody who wanted it to look like an amateur. Nobody else would hit a man that many times with a sap. Ah, uh, the oftener you go over it, the sillier it sounds. I'd sooner dig eggshells out of a garbage can than information out of you. Oh, I get it. You don't like me. Okay, I'll go home. Right after you start talking sense. For instance? For instance, you don't know anything about Marriott. You don't know how much money you were carrying. You don't know what it was supposed to buy back. Trusting soul, wasn't he? Now, where's the dough? Where? Well, right after I beat out Marriott's brains, and just before I hit myself on the top of the head, I hid the money under a bush. Ah. Uh, and that dame you claim you saw? Ah, uh, she must have thought I was somebody else. She took one look and got out fast. Suppose a jewel outfit got the bright idea of using a private dick for contacts and uh, payoff. Oh, great, great. Now I'm a finger for a heist mob. Look. I'm trying to be helpful. I get up off the nice cold ground. I don't use the car because Marriott's still in it. I walk five miles just so you can be the first to hear the news. I wait for you at the beach and lead you straight to the body so you won't have to wait till next Christmas to find it. I tell you all I know, it sounds screwy. It is screwy, but it's all I know. Sure. Now I'm tired of your bum guesses. Either book me or let me go home. Milo, you'd slit your own throat for six bits plus federal tax. Now look, Randall. Go on home and keep your big yap shut. One phony move and you'll be locked up as a material witness. Whoever killed Marriott, I'll get him. Yeah, you'll get him. About the time you get your third set of teeth. And stay away from Marriott's pals. I've been after those boys for a long time and I'm getting close. So watch your step or I may have to pick you up in the same basket with Jules Amthor. Yeah? Hey, is Jules Amthor mixed up in this? Oh, so you know Amthor. I know lots of people in this town, but I never heard of Jules Amthor. Bad guess, Inspector. Good night, Randall. And keep away from the newspapers. I'll do the talking. Well, I went back to my office the next day. I didn't want to be there because my head felt like a nest of rivets. One of my clients was dead, but the other one was still alive, Moose Malloy. And I figured he might be looking for me. Early in the afternoon, this kid walks in. Yeah, business is getting better and better. Prettier. My name is Ann Allison, Mr. Marlowe. I'm a reporter from the Post. Oh, have a seat, Miss Allison. Police haven't been very helpful on the Marriott murder. I was wondering... There's a question I always ask. How did you know about me? Oh, friends at City Hall. Uh, tell me, did Marriott tell you who owned the jade he was buying back? No. No, he, he didn't. Had you known him long, Marriott? A couple of weeks. Why? Well, I just wondered if you had any theories about... About what happened or what was supposed to happen. Oh, I've, I've got a couple, yeah. Say, hey, this is a nice-looking purse. Just what do you mean by opening it? I'd like to prove another theory, that you're not a reporter. Why do dames carry so much stuff in a pocketbook? Give it to me. I was looking for a driver's license, but your bank book will do. And the name on this bank book isn't Allison at all. It's Grail. Ann Grail. Please. Oh, you're a hot rock, baby. I could toss you to the cops. Last night, all I could tell them was that Marriott was buying back some jewelry. You could knock their hats off of that line about the jade. Tell me, Miss Grail, have you ever known a girl named Velma Valento, a singer? I never heard of her in my life. Oh, well, it's just a shot in the dark. Besides, it's another case. I was just hoping. Who does that jade belong to? What's your interest in it? My interest? Well, Marriott gave me a hundred bucks to take care of him, and I didn't. I'm just a small businessman in a very messy business, but I like to follow through on a sale. The jade belongs to my father. Oh, I gathered from Marriott that the jade belonged to a lady. My father happens to be married. Oh, oh. Well, your mother was wearing it the night of the holdup. She's not my mother. My mother's dead. My father married again. Who sent you here to feel me out? It was my own brilliant idea. I saw your name in the newspaper. Well, before I talk to Inspector Randall, I think I'll have a talk with your father and your father's wife. My car's downstairs. Except that I'm expecting to hear from somebody. Well... In that case, Mr. Marlowe. In that case, I'll go with you just the same. You're really a lot cuter than Moose Malloy. Come on, let's go. The 
before Dick Powell and his co-stars return with the second act of Murder, My Sweet, we take you to where there's a local war bond rally going on. And Mrs. White is curious about one of her fellow workers. Uh, Jean, stop here a minute, will you? Tell me, who is that attractive woman in charge of the next booth? Oh, that's Mrs. Jennings. Lovely looking, isn't she? Her daughter's a classmate of my Susie at college. Oh, now, Jean, don't tell me she's old enough to have a 20-year-old daughter. Why, well, she looks like a girl herself. It's her skin, I think. I've never seen her when a complexion didn't look like that. So soft and really fresh. Well, that's what a lovely Lux complexion does for a woman. Makes her look radiant, appealing. It's what you notice first about her appearance. That smooth, soft Lux complexion. Screen stars know how very important it is to have the charm of exquisite skin. That's why they're so careful never to take chances with complexion beauty. Here's what a famous star, Claudette Colbert, says. I never neglect my daily active lather facials with Lux soap. They're so easy, and they work. Here's what I do. I cover my face generously with a creamy lather, work it in thoroughly. I rinse with warm water, then cold, and pat my face dry with a towel. Now my skin feels smoother, softer, and it is. These facials the screen stars depend on really do make skin lovelier. Recent tests showed actually three out of four complexions improved in a short time with daily Lux Toilet Soap Care. Why don't you try it? You'll enjoy the extra creamy lather, the gentle caressing way it touches your skin. Nine out of ten famous screen stars use fine white Lux Toilet Soap. Why don't you begin your daily facials with Hollywood Beauty Soap tomorrow? Irving Pitchell brings our stars back for the second act. With Dick Powell as Philip... Claire Trevor as Helen, June Dupre as Anne, and Mike Mazurki as Moose Malloy, we raise the curtain on Act Two of Murder, My Sweet. Philip Marlowe continues with his story. This girl, this Anne Grail, she drove me to her father's place in Brentwood, a cozy eight or nine acres. Okay for the average family, only you'd need a compass to go to the mailbox. House was all right, too, but it wasn't as big as Buckingham Palace. I waited while she sold me to the old folks. It was like waiting to buy a crypt in a mausoleum. And then she called me in. Old man Grail looked like a college professor, and the old lady... Hmm, what an old lady. Blonde, gorgeous, and I guess about 30, with a face and a shape that'd make most pinup girls look like Gravel Gertie. She had dimples on her knees, and I was admiring them when the old man started to talk. Do you know anything about jade, Mr. Marlowe? It's, uh, green, isn't it? The jade stolen from my wife was a necklace, 60 beads of about six carats each. And very valuable, Mr. Marlowe. And there, why don't you sit down? What? Oh, yes. Now, how valuable? A somewhat larger necklace recently brought $125,000. Yes, I never should have worn it. It was stupid. Inexcusable. Where was the stick up? If you'll excuse me, I'm going to lie down. Mrs. Grail will talk to you. I'm most anxious to locate my jade, Mr. Marlowe. I can only hope it can be managed without any publicity. Wait a minute, Father. I'll go with you. May I mix you a drink, Mr. Marlowe? Uh, thanks. I hadn't thought there were enough murders these days to make detecting very attractive to a young man. Well, I stir up trouble on the side. Uh, tell me, uh, how much of your money was in Marriott's envelope? $8,000. Water or soda? Scotch. We assumed they'd never guess its real value. Who knew you were going to wear the necklace that night? My maid, perhaps. But I trust her implicitly. Why? Because I trust some people. I trust you. Did you trust Tom Marriott? In some things. You're not drinking, Mr. Marlowe. I thought detectives were heavy drinkers. Well, some detectives just encourage other people to drink. <laughs> Shall I tell you about the holdup? It uh, might help. Well, I'd been out dancing, and Tom was bringing me home. Where have you stopped? Oh, near here. Does it matter a lot? Oh, not too much at the moment, no. How many other guys take you out dancing? I'm very fond of my husband. Only his two steps getting a little stiff. <laughs> Miss Grail, do you know Jules Amthor? I've heard Tom speak of him. Why? Oh, I don't know. The cops told me to leave Amthor alone. Is he a bad boy? A lot of Tom's friends are, I'm afraid. Tom was rather a heel himself, but a nice heel. You don't know how horrible I feel. Why? Why? Because I'm responsible. I asked Tom to try to buy the necklace back. Oh, I, I just can't understand the whole business. All they took was a necklace. I was wearing a ring, too, but 
they didn't want the ring. Uh, about Jules Amthor, what, what's his racket? No, oh, he's sort of a psychic consultant. I think he's a quack. Tom went to him because he was all mixed up. He, he couldn't get started for fear of failure. I wonder if he'd take my case. <laughs> that sounded like the door closing. It was. Anne's been standing there. Oh, strange child. Mr. Marlowe, you will help me, won't you? Why? Because you like me or are you paying me something in money? Well, I've never hired a detective before. What are the rates? As much as a traffic will bear. How do I find Amthor? <laughs> well, he's really quite inaccessible. Yes? Mr. Amthor is here, Mr. Gray. Well, show him in. Well, don't look so smug. He really is inaccessible. I didn't have the faintest idea he'd be coming. Mr. Marlowe, how do you spend your evenings? I'm in the phone book. Mrs. Grail. Oh, come in, Mr. Amthor. This is Mr. Marlowe. Oh, how do you do? Mr. Marlowe is a private detective. He was with Tom when... when it happened. Oh? I was hired as a bodyguard and bungled the job. Now it's myself I'm investigating. Oh, these things are so difficult to believe. What could have happened? I've got a couple of notions. Would you like to help me work them out? Oh, I'm afraid I... I wouldn't make a good detective, Mr. Marlowe, and I'm... Yeah, I know, I know. You're inaccessible. The police told me to keep away from you. You look harmless to me. I'll be very glad to arrange an interview. Just leave your number with Mrs. Gray. Uh, don't go to any special trouble. I'll bring my own crystal ball. Hey, how do you get out of this fun house? I was home that night trying to add things up. Moose Malloy, Marriott, Helen the Beautiful Blonde, and Jules Amthor. I put it all together and it just thumbed its nose at me. I decided to go down to Florian's cafe and split an infinitive with the boss when the buzzer changed my plans. I had a visitor, Helen Grail. I just dropped in because I thought you'd be interested in what Amthor had to say. Oh, and here. Shall we call this a retainer? Yeah, let's call it a retainer. Mr. Marlowe, do the police know about me? Would that bother you? Well, my husband has a morbid fear of publicity, and, and he's not at all well. Oh, I'll manage it. Now, about Amthor. Oh, please. I don't like being rushed. I was hoping we could go out somewhere. Do you like the Coconut Beach Club? I've never been there. I'm the drive-in type. <laughs> <laughs> the lights there are very flattering. They'd even mellow you a little, I think. But it's the sort of a place where you're expected to wear shoes and a tie. Mm. I'll be right with you. We went to the Coconut Beach Club. We had a table in the corner. She gave me that dreamy smile and started asking questions. You know, you've got a nice build for a private detective. Oh, it gets me around. How does one get to be a private detective? <laughs> you don't mind my sizing you up a little? But most of us are ex-cops. I worked for the district attorney. Got canned. Surely not for incompetence. Uh, for talking back. I had an interesting childhood, too, but you didn't drop in on me to get a biography. You'd rather I talked about Amthor. That's right, a good guess. Well, then, stay right here. I've got to powder my nose, and then I'll tell you all about it. Well, just be back before I get stuck with a check. Mr. Marlowe, I'd like to talk with you. Well, hello, Miss Gale. I'd like to talk to you, too, but not now. Do the Grails always hold their family reunions here? It won't take long, what I have to say. Look, honey, I've already got a date. She'll be right back, and I don't want you two slugging it out in public. There's no danger of that. She won't be back. How do you know? Never mind. What did Helen ask you to do? She wanted me to kiss her and find her jade necklace. I may have the order wrong, but that's the general idea. Well, whatever she was willing to pay you, I'll pay you more. Just stay away from her. Why do you look at me like that? I don't know. I seem to remember you from one of my better dreams. You, you, you know, if I... Now what are you looking at? I'll be right back. Uh, hello, Mr. Malloy. Do you like this place better than Florian's? This the babe. I got something for you to do. Look, look, I'm a big boy now. Don't you want me to have any fun at all? I want you should meet a guy. Will you let go of me? Another ten seconds and gangrene will set in these fingers. Thanks. Okay, I'll ditch the babe. I 
couldn't ditch the babe. The babe had ditched me. First Helen had disappeared, and now Anne. Anne had left a card on the table. She'd written on it, I'll keep the offer open. I don't live in Brentwood. My address is 962 North Hoover Street. Moose saw me put the card in my pocket. He came over and hustled me out to the curb. There was a car waiting, also a guy to drive the car. He took us to a very ritzy apartment house, showed us up to the penthouse, and then did something that made me rather unhappy. You, uh, you carry a gun, Pally? Oh, I'm so used to packing one that hardly notices on me. I think maybe I better hold it, eh? Stop the stalling. Let's get inside. He was there, all right, Mr. Amter. Me and Moose got him. Thank you, Michael. Mr. Amthor, I'd like to, uh, to ask him about Velma. Don't be impatient. You and Michael wait in the other room. Come on, big boy. <clears throat> but you ask him quick. I want to know now. Where did, well, you, where did you pick up Moose Malloy? Where he uh, met at Mrs. Grail's. You said you wanted an interview. Huh? I must insist upon some sort of logical progression. We'll come to Moose Malloy later. As for my profession, my patients regard me highly as a psychic consultant, Mr. Marlowe. Years ahead of my time. Which might be one way of saying that some folks have made some complaints to the cops. It might be. Do you have another theory about me? Yeah, yeah, I do, and it goes like this. Married blackmail rich women, but somebody else found the women for him. Oh. Well, if you're right, I would be that somebody, and I would have Mrs. Grail's jade necklace, wouldn't I? Unless something went wrong, like Marriott losing his nerve and ringing in a private dick, a sucker who'd risk his neck for a C-note, but who might figure a jade necklace would be a nice thing to have in his bank. And would this hypothetical detective be willing to part with it for a consideration? Could be, if he had it. How much of a consideration? Well, it's difficult to say until he produces the jade. He might be bluffing, trying to gain information. In which case, a great psychic, uh, years ahead of his time, might try to beat the truth out of him. You wouldn't suggest that? Only if you wanted to wear your face backwards for a while. No, no, there's no need for us to be at each other's throats, Mr. Marlowe. And there's really no need for subterfuge. Putting it on the simplest and friendliest terms. I want that jade. I suppose I don't have it. I suppose I don't want to sell. You got him to tell you yet? No, Malloy. I asked him where Velma is. He refuses to tell me. Now, wait a minute. I don't like you not telling me where you got Velma. Well, if Amthor told you I know where Velma Valento is, he's nuts. He just picked you up to do his dirty work. I gave you some dough to find her. Well, keep your shirt on and stop dancing me around. He's lying, Malloy. He knows. Where you got her? I haven't got her, you dimwit. You shouldn't have done that. You shouldn't have hit me. All right, now, the two of you. Stay just where you are. What do you got to pull a gun for? Where's that necklace, Marlowe? If you tell me, I can stop Moose. I don't know. Very well, Moose. He's yours. Make him talk. So Moose went to work. Those fingers went around my throat tighter and tighter. That black pool opened up at my feet again, and I dived in. The rest of it was a crazy, cold-cut dream. I was going somewhere. I'd never been there before. I was drugged. Somebody had filled me full of juice. I was in the land of poppies, and I met a lot of interesting people. Necklace, Mr. Marlowe. Where is the necklace? I'm all right. What happened? I'm all right. You should have hit me like that. You should have hit me. Because I trust some people, I trust you. Because I trust some people. Help. Somebody, please help. Then I knew I couldn't go to sleep. Not if I wanted to stay alive. I could still feel those fingers on my throat. I even saw them. Just a bunch of bananas that looked like fingers. I wonder what I was full of. Something to keep me quiet, or was I dope to make me talk? Maybe both. Okay, Marlowe, I said to myself, you're a tough guy. You've been sapped, choked, and shot in the arm till you're crazy as a couple of waltz and mice. But you gotta get up and start moving. Let's see you do something really tough like putting on your pants. Well, I made it. Okay, you cuckoo. Your pants are on, now walk. And talk. What about anything, everything? 
Just talk and keep walking. You're getting out of here. Walk! I walked. I don't know how long. That kind of time they don't make in a watch. And then the smoke went away. The room turned into a room, and I knew I was ready to talk to somebody. I tore the bed apart and got a hunk of bed spring, and then I started to shout again. Help! Help! Mike walked in again, and I let him have it. Oh, that was a nice feeling. I crept down the stairs. There was a man in an office. The doctor's office, it looked like. I was in front of him before he saw me, but his hand went for the buzzer right away. That buzzer won't buy anything tonight, Doc. I just gave Nursie a sleeping tablet. For three days, sir, you have been a very sick man. Three days? You're swaying right now. Don't you realize that? I'm, I'm all cured, Doc. Now, what were you saying? I made no remark. I thought I heard you saying that you had a gun in that desk. And that if, that if you were very careful, you could sneak it out. A very stupid thing to do, Mr. Marlowe. Ah, uh, the gun. It's better. Now, talk some more. You've been suffering from narcotic poisoning. On account of you pumped me full of it. Speak up, Dr. Jekyll. I'm in a wild mood tonight. I haven't shot a man in a week. You very nearly died, sir. I had to give you digitalis. Also a little something to make me talk. What was I supposed to talk about? Maybe a jade necklace I haven't got? Mr. Amthor will be disappointed in you again. Never disappoint Mr. Amthor, Doc. It depresses him. I'm warning you, Mr. Marlowe. At any moment, you'll collapse. I must insist on your going back to bed. Get away from me. The gun, please. I want that gun. You're going to faint, Mr. Marlowe. Maybe you're right. Maybe you're right, but not on this carpet. I'll do my folding on a nice hard street. You'll never reach that door. Well, before I try, I'm going to rip something off. No, not your head. Just the telephone. So long, Doc. I'll look you up when I get insomnia again. I staggered out to the street and down to the corner. Then I thought I was seeing things again. Yep, there he was, Moose Malloy. I couldn't have knocked the ashes off a cigarette, but I tried to swing on him. He just held me up and started talking. You shouldn't have to fight with me. You ain't in such good shape. I'll, I'll murder you. I don't like to fight with nobody. I want for you to keep looking for Velma. Who planted you here, Amthor? Amthor tells me about you. But he was kidding all the time. Uh, he was kidding the pants off you, Buster. He doesn't want you to find your girl. Nobody's supposed to find Velma. He's got other plans. You ain't in such good shape. I better help you. Then get me a cab, you dopey gorilla. Where do you want to go? What's that card you got? It says 962 North Hoover Street on the card. You saw me pick up this card in the Coconut Beach Club. That's where the babe lives, huh? Yeah. I think I'll find out why she's living alone and if she really likes it. Now get me a cab. What do you want? Black coffee, Miss Grail. Eggs and a scotch and soda. You're drunk. You better get out before Hey, I... this is a nice place here. Is there room for you in the Brentwood Palace, or don't you like it out there? Why did you come here? Because the cops may be looking for me, and I'm not ready to talk. If you're not drunk, why do you look the way you do? Yeah, ask the second Mrs. Grail. She fixed up a blind date for me with Jules Amthor and a couple of his whipping boys. What happened? Are you all right? Uh, I don't think I'm supposed to be alive. Um, say that again. Say what again? The last thing you said. I said, what happened? Are you all right? Miss Grail, what were you doing out there in the canyon the night Marriott was killed? I was lying on my face when somebody threw a flashlight and asked me if I was all right, and then she said, what happened? Yeah, a girl with red hair and a crooked nose and a nice figure. Yes. A girl named Anne Grail. I didn't kill Marriott. You weren't out there just taking a hike. I didn't kill him. I'd say you overheard Marriott and your stepmother making some sort of arrangements about the jade. What if I did? You knew Marriott had been holding hands with her, and you didn't like that. I hate her. And you hated him, too. You hated anybody that had anything to do with Helen, so you bumped him off. You killed Tom Marriott. I didn't. I didn't do it. I didn't. <laughs> We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. A 
A brief intermission before our stars return in the third act of Murder, My Sweet. Meanwhile, it's 2.45 of a bright afternoon, just the day for Mary to be hard at work in her victory garden. There, that'll hold those pesky weeds for a while. Hello, Johnny. Telegram from me? What in the world? Have 48-hour pass, arriving 5.15. See you soon, darling. Signed, Jim. Oh, heavens to Betsy. He'll be here in a few hours. I'd die if he saw me like this. The house has got to be slicked up, too, and I've just got to fix something special for dinner. Well, here goes. Got to work fast. Now it's 3.45. Mary has accomplished wonders. Is giving the furniture one last polish. There. That looks something like it. And now to press my dress. The blue and green print Jim loves so. Now it's 4.45. The dress is ready, the dinner started, and there's still a half an hour to go. Oh, goodness, I feel all in. Glad there's time for my Lux Soap beauty bath. That'll do the trick. This lather's wonderful. So rich and creamy. I feel like a different person already. And I love this nice perfume Lux Soap leaves on my skin. Makes me forget all the work I've done and feel like Jim's girl again. And now it's 5.30 and Jim is here. Gosh, you're lovely, Mary. What makes you so sweet? So many clever girls depend on their Lux Toilet Soap Beauty Bath for a quick, refreshing beauty pickup. But most important of all... They know this secret. When I step for my Lux Soap bath, I know my skin is fresh and really sweet. Screen stars say a daily Lux Soap bath makes you sure of daintiness. And I found they're right. Screen stars, lovely women everywhere, discovered long ago their fine white complexion soap, Lux Toilet Soap, makes an exquisite bath soap, too. The extra creamy lather, rich and abundant even in hard water, leaves skin flower fresh. And screen stars tell you they love Lux Toilet Soap's delicate clinging perfume, too. Why not get some of Hollywood's fragrant Lux Toilet Soap for your beauty bath tomorrow? It's thrifty to use. You'll find each satin smooth cake lasts and lasts. Back now to Irving Pitchell and our stars. The curtain rises on Act Three of Murder, My Sweet, starring Dick Powell as Philip Marlowe, Claire Trevor as Helen, June Dupre as Anne, and Mike Mazurki as Moose Malloy. Philip Marlowe is in the apartment of Anne Grail, whom he has just accused of murder. I stood there in Ann Grail's apartment and accused her of killing Marriott. I was sure she hadn't done it, but I had to find out what she knew. I know just what you're thinking. If I didn't kill him, my father did. And if he did, you'd do anything to protect him? No. No, he couldn't do such a thing. Uh, I, don't, I don't buy it either yet. I, I was just trying it on for size. Won't you please go home? I, I'm expecting a date. I, I, I can't go home. There's a very stubborn character named Inspector Randall. And if he isn't on my doorstep right now waiting to pick me up, then two of his stooges are. So relax. Hey, your date? Probably. Wait here. Tell him you've decided to have a quiet little supper with me. Yes? My name is Randall. I'd like a word with your boyfriend. Oh, I was just talking about you, Inspector. I've been looking for you for three days. Pull up a chair. Miss Grail was about to fix some soft-boiled eggs and scotch. You wouldn't join us. Last time I saw you, I gave you some good advice. I guess it didn't take, huh? I didn't bother Amthor. I was going to, but I didn't get around to it. He got to me. Yeah, he gave me quite a party. How'd it go? What'll it buy me? This is straight, Randall. You'd like to get Amthor, and I'd like to help you. He annoyed me a little. I'm listening. Well, Amthor's a tough turkey. He works some kind of blackmail routine on dames who come to him with problems. I think Marriott was his contact man. Let's get to the new part, huh? Uh, the jewelry Marriott was after was a jade necklace that belonged to one of Amthor's patients. Well, Marriott fumbled the ball. Yeah? So Amthor figured I had it. He sent me to a little rest home where the teacher to talk. There's a guy there who's a whiz with a hypo. The address is 23rd and Descanso. Okay, okay. Who owns the jade? I told you. One of Amthor's patients. By the name of, uh... I don't know. Oh, Miss Grail. Yes? When were you last to your father's place in Brentwood? Not for several days. Is something wrong? Skip it, skip it. Marlowe, I figure what you told me is on the level. But don't make a habit of trying to help me. I might get grateful and lock you up. Uh, give me a call tomorrow. How could he know about me? I don't know. That's what happens when you let a cop go to school. He gets smart. <laughs> now fix up your face. we we got to get out of the marble quarry. Where? Brentwood. Oh. What's the matter? Oh, it's a funny thing. About every third day I get hungry. I, I can fix eggs and coffee if you want to wait. You know, you're crazy. 
Everybody takes a poke at you. They fill, fill you full of drugs, but you bounce right back and hit between tackle and land all over again. And I don't think you even know which team you're on. I don't know which team anybody's on. I don't even know who's playing today. At Brentwood, we saw Mr. Grail, and I've seen healthier-looking gents in the county morgue. His face was gray with worry. Something was eating him, more important than a missing jade necklace, a missing wife. Helen left yesterday. I haven't heard from her since. And have you seen her, have you? No, dear, but maybe... Well, maybe she went to the beach house. Beach house? It had been rented to Marriott indirectly through the bank. I think I'd better have a look at it. This whole thing has gone too far. Oh? Or maybe it's coming too close to home. Mr. Grail, I don't say you killed Marriott, but you could have, for a good old-fashioned motive. I did not kill him, Mr. Morrow, but I say it is better that he is dead. I'm not concerned if the police suspect me. I'm concerned about my wife. I, I'm losing her. Father, And that please. is why I say all this has got to stop. You drop the case, Mr. Morrow. I'll pay you well. Oh, fine. I get dragged in, get money shoved at me. I get pushed out, get money shoved at me. Everybody pushes me in, everybody pushes me out. Nobody wants me to do anything. Okay, skip it. I'll put a check in the mail. Yeah, well, I cost a lot to do nothing. I get restless. Throw on a trip to Mexico. Father, where are you... Stay here. Why? Because I want a key to that beach house. But you just told him. I can't stop now. Do the cops stop? Does Helen stop? Do you stop? What do you mean, does, does Helen stop? Oh, I don't know. If I always knew what I meant, it'd be a genius. You're vicious. You get some horrible satisfaction seeing people torn apart. Sister, you're hanging on to something that's going to smack you hard. If I stick, it smacks you sooner, sooner and cleaner. Maybe that's why I'm sticking. Oh, but I'd stick anyway, because a guy who hired me got killed. I'll... I'll get you the key. We went to the beach house. Things happened there. Some of them I can explain. One thing I can't. After we took a, look, took a look around, Anne and I were standing there in the dark, looking out that big front window toward the ocean, and before I knew it, we were in a clinch. Oh, it's nice to kiss a girl like Anne Grail. I told her she had a cute little face, even if her nose was slightly crooked. It isn't crooked. It just has a bump on it where I got hit with a baseball. I used to play shortstop. Philip. Yeah? What about my father? If we don't find I'm Helen, going to make you mad now, baby. But here goes. Your father really loves Helen. When I came along, you were afraid she might turn me into another Marriott. So you tried to buy me off. That didn't work, and I began to suspect your father. A real tough guesser might say that when he couldn't buy me off either, you decided to be nice to me. Like just now. There's nothing decent about you, is there? Nothing at all. Well, I, I don't always guess right. I, I may be wrong. I, I think I am wrong. Sometimes I hate all men. Young men, handsome men who don't work for a living and, and almost heels who are private detectives. <laughs> Helen. Oh, I'm sorry, darling. But you should know by now that men play rough. They soften you up and then they belt you one. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Marlowe. Hi. I didn't finish, Helen. I hate a lot of women, too. Especially beautiful, expensive blondes. All bubble bath and moonlight. And, and inside, cold and hard like blue steel. Only not that clean. Your slip is showing, darling. I'm leaving. I'll tell Father you're here. Well, how long have you been here, Mrs. Grail? Since yesterday. You just happened to leave the Brentwood place before the cops dropped in on your husband? Oh, please. Look, you hired me to get your necklace, so you stand me up in a corny rum joint and tell Amthor. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I thought you might have had the jade. Please, please don't blame me. You could have had it. What Amthor did, was it bad? Uh, it almost made me mad. No. <laughs> now, just what goes between you two? Well, he's blackmailing me. Well, that much even I can figure out. My husband is in love with me. I'm... I'm fond of him, and I'm grateful, but I find other men very attractive. I imagine they meet you halfway. I met Amthor through Tom Marriott. He's smart. He does know psychology. He got me talking, and of course I talked too much. He uncovered something, and the blackmailing started. I think if my husband had found out, it would have killed him. So you agreed to give Amthor the necklace? But before I could, it was stolen. By Marriott? Must have been. 
Amphor probably came to the same conclusion. He decided to kill him, and that's why Marriott wanted you for protection. All right, I'll, I'll buy it up to there. What happens now? I want you to help me kill Jules Amphor. Don't you see? You're the only one I can turn to. It's the only way I'll ever have peace. He'll never be satisfied, even if he does get the jade. Why me? Because I have a gun or just because I wear pants? Oh, please. Please, I need you so. I need help and peace desperately. I need you. Have you got anything worked out? Yes, but Ampho has disappeared. Uh, maybe I can find him. Well, then tell him you've got the jade and you're ready to sail. Then what? Well, that's my part. All right, uh, I'll dig him up. Oh, you're... You're wonderful. How would you like not having to earn a living? Wouldn't bother me a bit. <laughs> when will you be back? Uh, I may have a time finding him. Maybe not till tomorrow night. Oh, would you mind kissing me goodbye? No, Please. I wouldn't mind at all. I went straight to Amthor's apartment. I had a couple of keys, and one of them fitted the back door. I wanted to surprise Amthor. I thought it would give him a bang. I thought it would kill him. Amthor was on the living room floor. He wasn't must, just snapped, the way a pretty girl would snap a stalk of celery. Only for this job, you'd have to be a big man with a big pair of hands. I hustled downtown, bought a late edition. I wanted to see how the police were doing on the Marriott murder. And while I was looking at the paper, somebody was looking at me. I've been trying to find you all over. I got to go away. Yeah, yeah, Amthor's dead. I know, you didn't mean to kill him. You just shook him too hard because you wouldn't tell you where Velma is. You find her? Yeah, Moose, I find her. Where is she? You tipped the Johns off on her. I wouldn't want little Velma to do no stretch. Turn me loose. Turn me loose and stop waltzing me around. If the Johns got Velma... Nobody's got her. She's got herself. Yeah, you can see her tomorrow. Okay. Now go hide yourself and be here tomorrow night as soon as it gets dark. Moose showed up tonight like I told him. I sold him on waiting outside the beach house until I called him. That was like lighting a stick of dynamite and telling it not to go off. But I had a plan. Helen was waiting for him. Philip, Philip, did you find him? Did you find Amthor? He'll be here around 12. 12. Would you like to look at this? Hmm? This is it, Philip. The necklace. Where'd you get it? I went to Brentwood today. Got it out of my dressing table drawer. Surprise. In a flabbergasted sort of way, yes. It was never stolen. You faked the whole thing? I simply wasn't going to let Amthor get it. When he comes, he can take a look at it. Well, he, he may have a gun. He'll never get that far. So have I. You went to Brentwood. Then where's Anne and your father? I can't say. They were out. And now I'm going to be very grateful. Here, the necklace. It's yours. You're much too nice to be a grubby detective all your life. You told Marriott this thing had been stolen. Why? Well, he was close to Amthor. They both had to think it was stolen. Marriott fell for that? Of course. And you still think Amthor killed him? Who else? You. Oh, no. No, you, you can't mean that. Yes, I think Marriott was scared because he'd agreed to help you kill a nosy detective. The same detective Moose took to Florian's joint, the one Florian told Marriott about. Marriott had to help you protect his interest. You knew that. You were a living to him and to Amthor and, his, and in his modest way to Florian. You supported them. They knew you wouldn't be worth blackmailing if I found you for Moose Malloy. Oh, no, no, so I was nifty thinking, darling. At the canyon, one of us would get out of the car. It didn't matter who. Either way, you had Marriott and me separated, and you would tag us one at a time and get your 8,000 bucks and knock off Amthor later. Yeah, it might have worked, too, if it hadn't been for Anne chasing down there after you. Of course, my head's pretty hard. It's true. It's all true. Everybody was closing in on me. I didn't know which way to turn. And it almost worked, sister. I was almost as dead as Marriott. But killing a man with a blackjack, oh, that's no work for a lady. Well, after, after it happened, I, I didn't know what you would do. But now I'm, I'm so close to peace. So close. Just, just Amthor. But I can't face it alone. Don't desert me now. Sure. Amthor blackmailed you. He's got something on you, only it isn't what you told me. It isn't just men. Your husband could understand the men... No, yeah, it's the clink looming up. And it's no good understanding the clink. Moose is looking for you, Velma. Where is he? 
Where is Moose? Waiting for me to call him in. Eight years ago when you were his girl, what did you talk Moose into doing? He went to jail for you. Was it murder or something serious? Where are you going? To tell him that his red head has turned blonde. Come back. Huh? Oh. Oh, a gun. Well, well, that fits your personality better than a blackjack. And the pearl handle goes swell with your fingernail polish. You know, it's too bad it has to be like this. Don't move. Who is it? Well, well, come in, come in. Hello, honey. Darling, that gun, what are you... Close that door, Anne. Your timing, dear, gets worse and worse. We've been listening. Why didn't you tell me you were in such trouble? I wanted to spare you. I might have been able to prevent all this. Now, of course, it's too late, Mr. Marlowe. I see your point. Helen, if Mr. Amthor is coming, I think perhaps you'd better do it quickly. Father. Get inside, dear. Keep your hands up, Mr. Marlowe. I'll have to take your gun. I'll be with Anne, Helen. Oh, all by ourselves again. Yes. You know, this will be the first time I ever killed anyone I knew so little about and, and like so much. You and I, <laughs> just a couple of mugs. <laughs> but we could have got along. What's stopping us now? I can handle Moose. He broke Amthor's neck yesterday. What did you say? Something I shouldn't have. Amthor is dead. Yeah? Then that leaves only you. I'm sorry, but you know too... <laughs> Too, too much. I had to do it, Mr. Marlowe. I had to kill her. Hello, hello. Let's have the police. Give me that phone. Give it to me. Don't you realize he saved your life? Why must you suffer for that? The cops always like to solve murders done with my gun. She's dead, isn't that enough? She was evil, all evil. I think I hear a shot, Mr. Marlowe. I think I better come in. Moose. Moose, it didn't work out the way I planned. Never mind. I'd like to talk to Velma now. I'd... Moose. Don't touch her. She ain't hardly changed. Just like always. Cute as a bug's ear. I wasn't going to bother her none. She done all right. Who done this? I did. You shouldn't have killed her. Moose. You shouldn't have killed Velma. Moose. Get out of my way. Don't come any closer, please. Moose, will you listen to me? Moose! <laughs> That old black pit opened up again right on schedule. Blacker than the others and deeper. Well, that's the works. That's all I know on account I didn't see so well with my eyeballs scorched. They didn't keep me long at the hospital. Two hours ago, Randall came and picked me up. And everything I've been telling you, I've been telling him. He's sitting right here in front of me now. I wish I could see Randall. Wish the bandage wasn't on my face. I want to look at his ugly kisser and figure what he's thinking. Marlowe? Huh? Eh? There's a piece of paper here on my desk, a warrant for your arrest. I'm tearing it up. Oh, thanks. Uh, tonight, uh, when it happened, I, I heard the shots. I still don't know who got hit. It wasn't the kid, was it, Randall? No. No, you can get out of here now if you want to. You mean I'm sprung? Who backed me up? Who got shot? I heard three. Moose Malloy. Dead? Yes, and Grail. While they were fighting for the gun. Anne's okay, then. Huh. She thought it over while I was in the hospital and came around and backed me up, right? I didn't say. <laughs> McNulty, see if he gets home. Yeah. I'll buy you a ride in the cab, Marlowe. Hey, what are you putting in my pocket? The necklace. She gave it to you, didn't she? Yeah, I tried it on. It's wrong for my complexion. Then give it to your girlfriend. Strangle yourself with it. No, just go on, beat it. Let's go, Marlowe. So you can come in now, Miss Grail. Why didn't you tell him? Why did you have to keep him guessing? About your backing him up? Why don't you tell him? You can catch him outside. Just give Nulty the high sign. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Hey, Nulty. Yeah? What do you know about that redhead pitching for me? Uh, uh, yeah. Hey, are we alone or am I hearing things? Uh, what things? Like someone else is walking with us. Oh, you're on the street. Lots of people walk on the street. Oh, oh. Hmm. She had a cute figure, huh? I, I didn't notice. Hmm. You must be low on vitamins. <laughs> oh, she had more than a figure, too. Not a beautiful face, but a good face. I, I didn't notice. Hmm. Face like a Sunday school picnic. Oh, there's a cab down the block. 
Say, are you sure we're alone? Hey, hey, Cap. Yes, sir. Oh, well, I guess she thought I liked the blonde chewing on my face. Wish I could tell her. I wish I could... Duck your head, Marlowe. This here's the cab. Where to, mister? 800 South Kingsley. Yes, sir. Hey, Nolte, I... Hey, what goes? If I didn't have these bandages over my eyes... You going to the same address, too, lady? Uh, Nolte, I haven't kissed anybody in a long time. Would it be all right if I kissed you, Nolte? I think it would be just fine. I said, are you going to the same... Oh. Oh, yeah, I guess you are. (laughs) Now that we've cleared Dick Powell of murder... The rest of our cast can get back on their feet and join him at the footlights for a curtain call. You should have been in tonight's cast, Irving. You used to play in pictures. Well, thanks, Dick. But I'm too old to go through what you went through in tonight's play. Tell me, Claire, how does it happen that a nice girl like you always gets to play the bad girl role? Oh, I don't know, Irving. I guess they've got me typed. They had Dick Powell typed for a while, but look what he's doing now. That's right, June. Next week, he starts a whole new radio series as a tough detective. You mean I might yet get a chance to play a sweet young housewife? How about me, Mr. Pitchell? Do you think I could play Hansel and Gretel with Margaret (laughs) O'Brien? Maybe if you took a course in compression, Mike. You mean expression. No, I mean compression. Or else learn to walk on your knees and keep your hands behind your back. (laughs) Uh, Well, what do we do with June Dupre, Irving? Well, we just pat her on both cheeks and tell her to stay as sweet as she is. Oh, now, here, you aren't falling for that Lux complexion, Pitch. Why not? Other men have. That's right, Irving. That's why so many of us use Lux toilet soap. Look, uh, Pitch, while we're getting everybody out of acting ruts, what, uh, what sort of a role would you give yourself if you went back to acting? Well, you were mostly a heavy in pictures, weren't you? Yes, and I rather fancy myself in a light musical comedy part. You know, the kind of bright young chap who sings, Smile the while, let a smile be your style. You <laughs> Look, Irving, I, I think you'd better stick to making pictures. Incidentally, I understand from Paramount that you did great things with a medal for Benny. Well, I had a good story there to work with, Dick. A homeboy whose rival in love is an overseas hero. And a good cast. I'm looking forward to it, Irving. But uh, tell me, what do you have on Lux next week? Well, for next week, we have an altogether charming story with a most delightful cast. The Canterville Ghost, starring Margaret O'Brien, Charles Lawton, and Tom Drake. Take a group of high-spirited American commandos, billet them in an ancient British castle where their hostess is Lady Margaret O'Brien, and then haunt that castle by the most notorious ghost in England, and you have the elements of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer's entertaining and extraordinary comedy. The Canterville Ghost can haunt my house next Monday, Pitch. Good night. Good night. Good night. night. And all our thanks. This week, America salutes the Army's famous Quartermaster Corps on its 107th anniversary. The oldest supply branch of the armed forces, the Fighting Quartermasters, are seeing to it that American soldiers are the best fed, best clothed, best cared for fighting men in history. Theirs has been a gallant contribution to the cause of freedom. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, Join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Charles Lawton, Margaret O'Brien, and Tom Drake in The Canterville Ghost. This is Irving Pitchell saying good night from Hollywood. Every day, as the war against Japan increases in intensity, the need for waste, fats, and greases grows more critical. Here's one department where the enemy may be superior unless you help make up the difference from your kitchens. Save all waste fats and greases, no matter how discolored. Keep a clean can in which to strain them and take them regularly to your butcher. Remember, for every pound, he'll give you four cents plus two extra meat points. Murder, My Sweet was presented through the cooperation of RKO Studios, producers of Enchanted Cottage. Dick Powell appeared through the courtesy of the Fitch Bandwagon and will shortly be seen in the RKO picture Cornered. Claire Trevor will soon appear in RKO's Johnny Angel. Mike Mazurki is currently working on the RKO version of Dick Tracy. Heard in tonight's cast were Cy Kendall, Gerald Moore, Robert Regent, Norman Field, Eddie Marr, Dora Singleton, Charles Seal, Ed Emerson, and Leo Sharon. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. This program is broadcast to our fighting forces overseas through cooperation with the Armed Forces Radio Service. And this is your announcer, John M. Kennedy.